Good morning. I'm Joan McGrath, and today we're going to monkey around with this man. He is Dr. Lester Fisher, since 1962, the director of Chicago's world-famous Lincoln Park Zoo. Stay tuned. There are animal stories ahead on Dimension. <laughs> is host to four million visitors, an innkeeper to 2,200 creatures on land, sea, and in the air. He is Lester Fisher, doctor of veterinarian medicine and director for the past 23 years of Chicago's prestigious zoological park. Though as zoos goes, it occupies a small space, 35 acres, Chicago's Lincoln Park Zoo has a worldwide reputation for excellence and innovation. And that is thanks in large measure to my guest today, Dr. Lester Fisher. Appreciate your being here, Dr. Fisher. Jones, I remember nice as a kid, to be here. as a kid, going to the <clears throat> zoo with my grandfather, mm -hmm. dutifully, every Saturday mm -hmm. and Sunday we used to go. And I used to feel a tremendous amount of compassion for those poor animals locked up in those cages. Does it bother them as much as it bothered me? I'm not sure about that because we equate bars and cell-like structures with jail. And so we think of animals in the old facilities, not only at our zoo, but zoos throughout the world, as being in jail. Uh, it bothered me to see the animals in these situations, and that's why we're trying so hard to change. But to an animal, uh, perhaps the bar wasn't a jail. To the animal, the cage in which it lived was home, and it was security. So. It's easy for us to kind of transfer our thoughts to what we believe the animal's thinking, and uh, there's no question that the animals were in totally inadequate spaces because today we know better. But when Lincoln Park Zoo was founded, and it might be the oldest zoo in America. 117 years back ago. Back in 1868, that's a long time back, uh, things were considered differently. Uh, zoos were a place to exhibit animals, period. In other words, you went to the wild, you plucked an animal from its wild home, you brought it to a city, you put it in a cage, and people came and looked at it. And um, perhaps at that time, uh, uh, the biologists didn't know better, uh, the communities that uh, funded the zoos didn't really grasp the importance, and uh, people probably thought of animals as expendable. They didn't live long, they weren't cared for as we know it today, and uh, there were always more in the wild to replace the one that died. Has the philosophy of zoos changed over the years to a perspective that you now perceive your role as a sustainer of vanishing species, mm -hmm. as an institution which ultimately protects the animals, not sure. just Very showcases much. them? And sometimes perhaps people think we speak with a strong bias on an issue, and that's understandable because we are strongly biased. Uh, uh, we speak for the animals. And uh, if one looks back just 25 years ago, and that's when there really were still unlimited animals in the wild. Because when I became director, I could pick up a telephone, I could send a wire, I could write a letter, and I could secure any animal anywhere. And it was no big problem. And the native uh, country was more than correct. willing. Correct. And today it's all changing. So I think if we look ahead the 25 year span, it's my considered judgment, and I think conservatively, that there will be very few places left in the world for a wildlife. I think the national parks, uh, some animal reserves, and the zoological gardens, that's where they're going to be. That must be personally very, very frustrating to it's, you. Uh, it's discouraging uh, because there are an awful lot of people problems in the world, and therefore our concern are the animals. But people are part of the problem. Uh, as there are more people, and I'm not good at math, but the mathematical projections of how often now our population doubles on Earth and the escalation of the population, uh, that creates pressure on the wilderness area. We need more food to feed the people, so the agricultural needs grow. And uh, therefore, the spaces left to the wild animal, which at one time were unlimited, seemingly, just each year shrink a little bit. Not to mention poaching, not to mention... Well, those are all other pressures, but the biggest problem is wildlife habitat. In other words, if animals have spent 
a million years developing in a forest. If we cut down the trees for lumber, the forest is gone, the animal's home is gone. That's the kind of thing that's the real concern. What are you as a professional in zoology doing to, to change the tide? Well, education, I think, is important, and uh, media such as yours and a program such as this are the things that are truly very helpful and very supportive. Uh, I think today people are more aware of conservation than ever before. I think people are supportive of programs, both in the wild and at home. Uh, I think uh, large sort of conservation groups, uh, such as the Audubon Society, that are very much into birds and open lands preservation organizations, uh, National Wildlife Federation. There are many groups to which people give support today that probably didn't really do much 20, 30 years before. They didn't have that support. And uh, I know that today people are supporting our zoo. And when you spoke about coming there with a grandparent, uh, that's part of the fun history of Lincoln Park. It seems like so many generations of people have come through the zoo that I hear comments like that, and it's a source of great satisfaction. It is a true community resource. And I've even said, and again, everything I say is with bias about Lincoln Park or the animals, it's one of the few happy places in town. It's a place where all segments of society come and have a good time. And the stresses are fortunately minimal. Uh, I just recently went to my first ball game in a year. And there were many police officers helping with traffic. There were policemen helping crowd control. On a nice Sunday afternoon at Lincoln Park in the summer, we can put 30, 40,000 people through that place. Without security. Minimal security. And it's because the mindset of the visitor. And that's a nice thing. And everyone feels it's their zoo. And I try so hard to make that apparent to the community. That's it a beautiful thing. It isn't anyone's zoo. It's everyone's zoo. And Clearly, you have achieved that objective. Let well, us go back to talking about animals who are at risk mm -hmm. of vanishing. A zoo's role, in, in one measure, is in breeding those animals and ensuring mm -hmm. that the population continues. And the Lincoln Park Zoo has been in the forefront of that breeding process. But it's not easy, is it? There are a lot of animals no, that not. simply don't want to breed in captivity. Correct. And also, we can't save all of them, Joan. That's the tough part. The tough part is, in other words, we humans are making decisions affecting other living creatures on Earth and the thousands of species. We can only, we collectively, the zoos, can only save, say, let's say, some hundreds of species. And as I redeveloped the new areas at the zoo, the staff would sit down and we would discuss, where's our commitment? Uh, in the old bear line at Lincoln Park, at one time we had 11 different kinds of bears. We had a little of everything. In fact, we today refer to that as a coin collection or a stamp collection philosophy, a little bit of diversity. Now the whole change is to have less kinds of animals but give them better homes. And at Lincoln Park today, we only have two species of bear, the polar bear and the spectacle bear. And I feel that happily, Brookfield Zoo, Milwaukee Zoo are within driving distance comfortably. And so people can see different kinds of animals at the different places. Speaking of other zoos, it, do you have a good relationship with them? Oh, yes, There's Brookfield yeah. here locally, and Chicago's kind of unique to have sure. two zoos in the area. And an aquarium, a world famous old aquarium that's one of the largest still. Um, I would say that professionally we all get along extremely well. All the zoos in America and here in town the two zoos. The staffs are friends, we interact daily, uh, the animals exchange back and forth. The only area that we're competitive is as with all cultural institutions and that's in securing funds. And that's an open, honest, friendly competition because right in our own neighborhood here, the Chicago Historical Society, the Chicago Academy of Science, they're doing the same fundraising Lincoln Park Zoo is doing, each for a different purpose. We will talk about fundraising, and we also have some animals to share with you, and we'll get to that in just a moment. I want to go back to the difficulties with breeding. Mm -hmm. I read recently that even in the wild, one major problem that vanishing species are having is inbreeding. Mm -hmm. That is genetically breeding with mm -hmm. other animals that are so genetically um, alike that they are vulnerable to disease. 
do zoos exacerbate that situation? Yes, very much so, and it's a whole new area of concern to us in the last five to ten years. The reason being, we always could bring in some new wild creatures and bring in some new genetic material. Uh, with all of the laws and our commitment now to try and do captive propagation, not to bring animals from the wild anymore, we've closed the breeding groups. And, uh, uh, for example, five years ago, I don't think there was a geneticist on a zoo staff in North America. Today, there are already several. Within the next five years, every big collection will have one. And what we try to do is minimize the inbreeding problem, and that's where the cooperation between the zoos come into play, because each zoo has a limited population of a specific kind of animal. And you could be part of the problem Correct. before you were part of the answer. Very much so. And by exchanging an occasional animal, you bring in a whole new mathematical dimension. Uh, we, for example, uh, have the Indian lions. Now, they started with a strike against them. There are less than 200 left in India in the wild. So that already is a small, closed, wild population, when we bring a few into Lincoln Park and start a breeding program to conserve these animals, inbreeding is very definitely a concern. And as quickly as possible, we started sending animals out to Europe, to other American zoos, as part of this outcross, even within a small population. Uh, we're extremely fortunate, for example, in our gorillas. Uh, we happen to have, we think, the finest and best collection, the best looking uh, anywhere in the world. And one of the most prolific. So it's uh, been doing great. And we have three family groups. So we can shift certain animals from group to group and not have any inbreeding at this time. But we've already sent several animals to other institutions because they'd reached a stage where they had no alternative. And that's part, again, of this long-term program of cooperation and helping. Uh, some cases, inbreeding may not always be necessarily bad because horse breeders, dog breeders do some inbreeding to accentuate positive factors in an animal, but if you accentuate some negative ones, then you're in trouble. What do you do about the flip side? Now, obviously, you are dedicated to improving the population of vanishing species. But what about those real prolific animals, the ones that just produce litters of, of dozens? Well, what do you do with those animals? First of all, we are housing less and less because of the fact we're concentrating more and more on the endangered ones. But secondly, we practice birth control procedures at the zoo. Uh, many of the cats, not at our zoo up till today, but many zoos have had vasectomies on the male animals. Uh, we do an implant. We do a hormone implant in our female animals, and uh, therefore, we don't have babies. And uh, jaguars, for example, we have a good supply. They do well in other zoos, too, so we're not trying to breed the jaguars. Our older para-Siberian tigers, they've been on birth control for some years now. Uh, the wolves, we have a lovely group of wolves there, and for a long time, we just had a mother living with six sons. And there was kind of a... A, a sociological barrier. Truly? The, yes. Where Against the, incest in, yes, and animals? Yes, in, in the wild this happens. And yet, for whatever reasons, when we moved to the new facility, within a year and a half, that barrier broke down and we had a litter of wolf pups. Well, since then, we have spayed the mother the same way we might a dog at home. And so, uh, we do practice that. In some zoos, they just will put together a bachelor herd of antelope, let's say, or just the female herd. And uh, we have to because our spatial requirements are varied with different species. And uh, what do you do? You have to work within the parameters. And it must cost a fortune to run a zoo and to feed animals. And well, it's, uh, it's expensive. The, the, the real expense with a zoo is that it's 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. Even and when we fair weather fans are only whatever. there during the summer. We huh? happen to be there all the time. We have to protect at night with our night keepers. We have to monitor the animals. And so it's a labor intensive operation. And all of the basic operating costs of Lincoln Park Zoo are borne by the Chicago Park District. They own and operate the Lincoln Park Zoo. Then we have a citizen support group, the Lincoln Park Zoological Society, and they help generate private funds to help the district with programs at the zoo. How many bags of that monkey food do you have to sell to make ends meet? Well, <laughs> what portion of your the, budget the comes from the The sales from the concessions truly go back to the park district general fund. So they are not directly related to the food 
that we use or to the department, the zoological department budget. Uh, we spend about $300,000 a year on animal food. Wow. And happily, in the last seven years, we have a new commissary to work from where we can buy in quantity. We have good freezer capacity. It's a challenge preparing diets for over 400 different kind of animals. And uh, the nutrition is really a, a big hunk of it. The question I started to ask before I was being facetious, what portion of your budget has to come from the public? Well, it's approaching almost a 50-50 split for the total budget. Keep in mind that the public, through taxes, contribute the basic operation of the zoo. The Chicago Park District gets its funds from the real estate tax base to Chicago. So everybody that lives in Chicago supports Lincoln Park Zoo through the tax structure. Uh, then the fact that we are still one of the few free zoos left in America, but also the world, because most countries, including China and Russia, charge for their cultural institutions. And so that's a nice thing as long as we can afford to do it, but the private contributions really bridge the gap. As inflationary costs go up and the district's budgets have limitations, then the private dollars and programs come in and they really make the difference. How vulnerable are you to the political wars? If the head of the Park District, Ed Kelly, is not getting along with Mayor Washington. Is the zoo deleteriously happily, affected? Happily, I'd say that we are kind of an accepted neutral entity within whatever political factions go on in the city because first there's a history of over a hundred years and political parties have come and gone, administrations have come and gone. Uh, during my many years, the commissioners of the Chicago Park District have been totally supportive of the Lincoln Park Zoo. The superintendents, and I've now worked and served under perhaps five or six, totally supportive. I think the Park District realizes the zoo is very much an important part of the community. Our animal keepers are civil service employees. Uh, my staff, when I need a new curator, I advertise nationally and recommend the best possible candidate. Uh, I feel very privileged uh, to work in a part of the city that I think really, sure, we're part of the city, the park district, the political park. But on the other hand, I think everyone respects that the zoo is a professional kind of operation. And so it, it really, at least up till now, has not made a difference. And every mayor that's been mayor since I've been there, they all come and feel welcome. Every governor and senator, whatever party, they come and feel welcome. And I've tried very hard to keep the zoo a, a, a very much a, a neutral place. You brought several denizens of that zoo to keep us well, company today. Um, I don't want the show to get away from us before we get to meet them. Uh, I'm one of those people that's still a little skeptical around animals, but what have you brought us? I brought a little screech owl because I think it kind of represents some very wonderful birds, and I brought a little armadillo because we happen to have probably the best collection of edentates in the world at Lincoln Park. Let's start with him. He's All funnier right. looking, and you already criticized me for saying that about your, oh, your just, young friend here. I was just kidding about that because, you know, every parent thinks their children are the best looking, and so I think my kids are the best looking. And uh, this little animal is one of a kind You're of gonna armadillo. You're going to hold on to it now, right? I'll, I'll be careful, <laughs> but it's fun if it walks, almost like a little mechanical wind-up toy. He's a mammal. Now, this I is a mammal. I thought that they were like the iguanas, part All of the right. reptile And the family. secret of why it's a mammal, in part, is this, hair. Uh -huh. One distinguishing characteristic of mammals are that they're warm-blooded, they nurse their babies with mother's milk, and they all have hair. Now, some may be bald, but they have hair. A whale, for example, when it's young, has hair, and it's a mammal. Can and I so, touch it? of course, you can, and it's fun. I think the reason this is hard as you bet, the shell. <laughs> and the reason you have this reptilian feel is because of the shell, and because again, the scale of the reptile is characteristic of the reptile. Is this a baby? Uh, no, this is an adult, and this is what we call a three-banded armadillo, and it's easy to count three bands. Whereas the Texas armadillo, which is a lot bigger animal, is a nine-banded armadillo. Can you turn him upside down? He has claws. Uh-huh, you bet. And what they do is, since they don't have teeth and can't bite, the claw is the way they dig into the ground to protect themselves, but they also, with that claw, potentially can protect themselves a little bit. And I was the so main, worried about getting bitten by it and has oh no, no teeth. The main protection here is the shell. 
And of all the armadillos, this is the only one that can curl up totally into a ball. Oh you my, You can see how, how the tail and, and the head curl and up. And that's his defensive mechanism? That's a defense. And so if some other animal were to come along and try biting it, it, it just, uh, there's nothing to bite. What does he eat? Animals like this are primarily vegetarians. In nature, they grub around in the earth and they'd eat whatever vegetative material they can get. We give ours a vegetable plate, a variety, uh, various small grubs and insects and that that they could get hold of, they would eat. Uh, there's one other interesting medical fact about not this animal, but the nine-banded armadillo. It's the first animal that they've ever been able to reproduce human leprosy. So they can study in Louisiana at the National Institute of Health, they can study the disease in a armadillo. I know you've been asked a million times whether that bothers you a little, that animals are used for experimentation purposes. Well, if it's done humanely, if it's done properly, if it serves mankind, I anyway, as a scientist, as a veterinarian, uh, believe that there is much to gain for man. So if, uh, if the whole issue of animal research is brought up, it's a tough one because we all feel strongly about the positions we have. At the zoo, happily, we don't do research as we think of biomedical research on our animals. We do research for nutrition, try to figure out how to feed them better. Uh, we do research in reproductive biology, this business of breeding, conservation, the endangered species. Uh, we do thorough autopsy studies if animals die so we can better keep the remaining ones in a group healthy. And again, uh, trade this information with others around course, the world. Of course. So re research is kind of a broad word. Behavioral research is ongoing all the time. And uh, how can you resist a cute Aww, little kid he is like so that? so cute. <laughs> See, you've already, <laughs> you've already changed your whole and it's attitude. Hard as a rock. And uh, the giant, right. the giant anteater, the sloth, and the armadillo zoologically represent a group of animals we call edentates, and they are the toothless animals. There's no incisor or front teeth, and uh, again, that's an area that Dennis Merritt, my assistant director, has spent years studying. He's gone to South America and Central America to look at those animals, and so we again have made a major contribution into keeping this group of animals alive in captivity and breeding. It has been said on numerous occasions that our show is going to the birds, so perhaps uh, we could turn. That was a very awkward transition, I realized, no. but appropriate under the circumstances. I'm not sure if I'll need my glove. I brought it only because sometimes these kids can scratch a little bit. Is he going to fly away? Well, hopefully not, because I have him on a Jess, and the Jess is a little leather thong. Come on, kid. Come on. Say hello. Say oh, hi to are you pretty? I guess I may not need the glove. Uh, the reason I brought the glove, one of the characteristics of a bird of prey are the talons. In other words, the nail. And uh, with that, they grab their food. Uh, the other characteristic of a bird of prey is the hook beak. And I guess he'll turn around and face the camera. There we go. There we are. And so those are the two things that enable this type of creature. And it's an animal. We think of animals and mammals differently. We call, say, the armadillo an animal. It's a mammal. This is a bird, but it, too, is an animal. Likewise, reptiles All and the members aquatic of the animal animals. Kingdom. And if you feel brave and slowly, carefully want to touch the back of this bird, you will find the softest feathers I think you have ever felt. Oh, and that's a very my. special zoological characteristic of this kind of bird. The owls have this type of feather because when they fly, they don't want the prey, the mouse or the other rodents, to hear them flying. So this soft Cushions feather allows them flight. to just quietly find their prey. And of course, the wonderful big eyes are because they're more or less nocturnal. Uh, they're most active when the light level is very low in the late evening, early morning. <coughs> And another thing, of course, about owls, some people think they can swivel their head around. Well, that's it, what he's doing right this it's minute. It's not quite true because they can turn it part way, but they can't go 365 <laughs> degrees. No, no one believes that. Well, there are people somehow because sometimes they start one way and quicker than the eye can follow, the, they go the other way. And so some people say, hmm, they turn their head. That's when they're losing their head over here. One thing that happens is they can't turn their eyeball the way we do. In other words, we can hold our head rigid and we can look in either direction. For them to look in a different direction, the head turns because the eye is fixed. 
you are affording me a marvelous opportunity, giving me the option of touching these animals and being so close. What about the visitor to the zoo? Now, the visitor should respect every sign. They should respect every guardrail because animals at the zoo, at any zoo, certainly at the Lincoln Park Zoo, are potentially dangerous wild animals. And when our visitors forget that, or even our employees, they can get hurt. And what happens is these particular two animals come from our children's zoo. I know they're reasonably predictable. They bite. This animal could bite me right now if it wanted to, but it's been handled so many times carefully and safely and humanely, it has no reason to bite me. This show is going to get away, and I wish we had hours to spend with you, but I did promise that we could talk about some of the programs at Lincoln Park Zoo, because as we have established, it takes money to run a zoo. Yes, it does. Very much so for two reasons. One is for the capital improvements to make the new structures, the new facilities possible. And for that, we have a very wonderful arrangement with the Chicago Park District and the Lincoln Park Zoological Society. For each dollar that the private sector gives to the zoo, to the zoo society, the park district matches it. So that if, for example, we're successful in the next three years raising five, six million dollars of private dollars, the district will match it with four and a half million dollars. And uh, we hope through that to renovate the fine old buildings. We call that our landmark campaign. The Lion House is a classic structure, been around for 60, 70 years. The Bird House, the Monkey House. I want to save the old buildings now and put in some new animal spaces. You've been with the zoo since 1947. First mm -hmm. of all, you were an attending veterinarian. Correct. And then commencing in 1962, you took on the directorship. Mm -hmm. Your life has been invested in this zoo. Very much so. What's your proudest accomplishment? Oh, well, I guess two things generalizing. One is being able to rebuild the place and give animals a decent home. That to me is paramount because you mentioned earlier about this business of putting an animal in the cage and how you felt walking around. Uh, I have that same concern, genuine, honest concern. And so I feel knowing the parameters of space, we can't give them a while, but we can give them a decent home. To me, being able to see the old zoo changing is very satisfying. And the other, I honestly feel, is seeing people come and enjoy. One has to assume that you could have earned more money in private veterinary practice. Well, I had but a you very chose. successful practice. But you chose the Lincoln Park mm -hmm. Zoo. Because there's an old saying in this world that circus gets in your blood. I think zoo does the same thing. And what happens is if you spend some time around these animals, they get to you. And so I really look upon that collection almost as an extended family. I, I helped deliver some of them. I buried some of them. I treated some of them. I purchased some of them. And so they're very much part of me. Speaking of being part of the family, you still have the ADOPT program so that that little mm -hmm. fella can be part of my family, too. The Zoo Society has had a very successful program for some years. You're supposed to look out that way. That's <laughs> it. And uh, the idea is that it's kind of a fun way to help the cause. Uh, instead of just being a member of the society, which in itself is very meaningful to us, people can adopt. And uh, it's, of course, a psychological adoption. You get a certificate, and you get a pin, and you get invited to special parties and things like that. The idea is that, again, it's a way to raise funds. We sometimes take our zoo for granted. I hope this has been a bit of a refresher course, just to remind you about the wonderful adventures that are there for you at the Lincoln Park Zoo. And maybe if you visit again, you'll also feel an inclination to help support this marvelous cultural opportunity that we have in Chicago, world-famous Lincoln Park Zoo. My guest today has been its director, Dr. Lester Fisher. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you, fellow too. Thank you very much. We've enjoyed being here with you. We'll see you next time on Dimensions. Until then, have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.